Dr. with Marjorie Ishmael for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, December 13th, 2007 in Stewart Center, the television uh, studio. Dean of Verse, Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about uh, your early years and your parents and where you grew up in England. I grew up in northern Hampshire. And where, when you were born? About, and, yeah, yeah, about 45 miles west of London in a small village called Sherman St. John, quite the picturesque village, actually. My sister still lives there. She's retired there, so it's nice I get to go back there. And uh, nothing very extraordinary, really. Went to the church school in the village and later to the uh, high school in the nearest town, which was Bainstoke, and um, went through school there and then uh, went to Goldsmiths College of London University in London, although we were evacuated to Nottingham because our college was bombed quite badly during World War II. And I was starting just as the war ended, so I spent a year in Nottingham in the Midlands and then back to London, which I loved, and graduated from there. When, uh, in the village, was the school you went to in London, was that a college or like ours is today? Four year or is it? Well, it, it no. was part of London University. Okay. It was one of the colleges of London University. And the degree program in England is three years, so it's a three year program. But um, we do have 13 years of schooling, so it adds up, <laughs> it adds up the same in the sure, end of your right. bachelor's degree. Yeah. And then I taught for a year in England, and uh, then I went overseas after that. Okay. Tell us a little bit about what you were involved in and when you were in college. What was it like? Did you live in the, uh, or did you commute to uh, going well, to school in those days? Well, the first year when we were evacuated to Nottingham, we were sharing the premises of Nottingham University. It wasn't Nottingham University then, it was just a university college which took London degrees, so our curricula were the same. And so we mingled in with their students and we actually took over their men's residence hall because most of the men had gone after the war. And so they moved out into what we called digs, lodging, and we lived in their hall, which was uh, part of a beautiful old, um, I don't know how old it was, but a very gracious manor house. <laughs> what was it like during the war in England? Um, oh, well, <laughs> what aspect? And going to school, too, at the well, same time. Well, I guess my school, my, I used to have high school was 11 in England, and um, I had just had one year of high school when the war started, and of course everything changed because all outside activities uh, practically ceased. There were a few little groups like our French circle, which continued in the afternoon, but in the winter we finished school very early to get home before it got dark and before the potential for bombing occurred and um, there were times when that did indeed happen. We were in the country so um, the town of Badenstoke had a couple of air raids on it and uh, in the village we had a number of stray bombs. I realized looking back through a diary recently how much more frequent that was than I really remember now. It sort of was woven into life that there were the anti aircraft guns and they would go off and make rather a lot of noise. <laughs> You sort of got on with your life, really. <laughs> you had to learn how to, to take care when the alarms and the sounds went. Well, you knew when you should go to the shelters, although we really didn't have a proper shelter. Um, but we did. We did sure. take precautions, let's say, especially at night. Most of the activity was at night, and the planes would be going over us, going to the Midland or northern part of England, or we could see. London, when London was being bombed, we could see oh, the glow wow. in the sky, and we could also see Portsmouth and Southampton, England, a small place, <laughs> you know, it's smaller than Illinois, just England, and so you really could tell where time. the rage yeah. when it were. Mm. Now, you, what was your major then in, in college? Uh, well, geography was my main subject, I uh -huh. took uh, English and history also, but geography was my first love. <laughs> and then tell us what you did after you, after you got your degree. Well, I taught for a was, year. The, the war, war was over? Well, yes, right? I, as I started, the war it had ended in August, and I started at the university at the end of September. Um, I took a job actually near my home and lived at home uh, for a year, uh, a rural school, which was quite different from the school I'd gone to, actually, but it was interesting. I taught geography there and odds and ends of other things as needed. And uh, then um, I had, during my final summer at uh, university, I had uh, worked at the Olympic Games in London in 1948, 
and uh, actually met my future husband there, although at the time we were just rather casual friends. I took him to Windsor one day, I remember, and we, we did a few things like that. But uh, when he went back to Egypt, he was from Alexandria, he looked up somebody I'd been at school with who was teaching out there, and she wrote to me immediately and said, are you interested in teaching out here because we have positions available next year, seven positions, one of which was a geography position. Um, so, are you interested? And I was, and I wrote, and I didn't get the geography position, actually. They said I was, hadn't had enough experience. I did eventually get it, but I went and taught some general form subjects, they called it, which included a bit of geography. Yeah. So you went ahead. What did your parents think about you going? That's quite a distance. Uh, well, my mother and my father had died when I was in university, actually. Um, well, I think they were a little alarmed, but you know, if you study geography, you naturally want to see the places you, <laughs> you, you learn about. It. Sure. I was rather well known for liking to go off on cycling weekends. In fact, I started a club at the school where I taught for youth hosteling, we called it. So they, uh, they probably weren't all that surprised sure. when they thought about it. I think the initial surprise of what are you thinking going to Egypt, is it safe? <laughs> well, actually, it was so, totally safe. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, so share with us your, your experience there. What did you do when you were there? I taught you? in a private British boarding school called the English Girls College. We had day, day girls as well as boarders. But we took in children from all over, girls from all over the Middle East. We even had a family from Malaysia who sent all their daughters to us. Now, we had a few English girls, most of whom went back to school in England as soon as they got to be about somewhere between 12 and 14. Um, the, the girls were probably about half Egyptian and the other half were from oh, Greek girls. A lot, of, a lot of Greek people lived in Alexandria at that time. So um, just from all over, Turkey, you name it, Dan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. They were interesting girls to teach. It was a and then whole new experience. Was the, uh, what town, was, what city was that in? Alexandria. Alexandria. Yeah, okay. on the Mediterranean. Okay. Beautiful city, actually. Yes. Yeah. And did you uh, touch base with the friend that you had met at, in England? who turned out to be... Oh, yes, yes, oh. yes. He, <laughs> yes, he played basketball. He was fairly well known. It was rather hard not to know about him, actually. So we, we did meet up. And uh, I, the first time we went out, I remember he said, I've got two friends I'd like to bring along, and you can bring two of your friends along. And that was rather a common way, I think, in which young people got together. It wasn't sure. so easy for uh, Egyptian young people to meet. And... Um, Yes, so we did, and after two years we were married, or two years after that, so we'd actually known each other for three years, and uh, we were married, and I went back and continued teaching there. But then he had gone from being a physical education teacher in a high school to working uh, in, well, it was a university-level institute of higher education. And, um, in Egypt? In Egypt, mm -hmm. in Alexandria. And in order to be promoted, he needed to get a doctorate, which he could not at that time get in Egypt. And so it was either England or the U.S. And the U.S. was much more popular at that time amongst the young Egyptian professional folk. <laughs> so sure. we applied to Indiana University. It was the only place he applied to, and he was accepted. So. What was your first impression then coming, this first time you visited the States, correct? When you oh, came? yes, I had not been to the States before, yeah. Uh, well, I think I thought it was all going to be quite easy, and the, uh, the, the couple friends of ours and friends of ours in England, the husband was an American from World War I, and he'd lived in England ever since, but he said to me, you're going to find the United States a bigger culture shock than Egypt, because the British were still very much in evidence in Egypt. And so a lot of things in the way I lived my life were still in the British. fairly British, although of course it was in the background of Egyptian culture. And that was true. You think you speak the same language, but you remember Winston Churchill's famous quote to people, who was it? 
um, divided by a common language. <laughs> <laughs> so I had uh, to learn all the Americanisms, and sometimes I had a little trouble. And that in itself is a challenge. Yes. 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 And the campus was a lot different than what you'd been used to, I would imagine, too. When you oh, came yes. You in know, the London University doesn't have a campus as such. It has a series of colleges which are scattered all over. And the college I went to, oh, I suppose we were between five and 600. I mean, the total of the university is very large, of course, but your life is in your college. So that was quite different. And uh, fortunately, we had made friends of a Fulbright couple with a full right couple in Egypt, and so they met us and were very kind and very. When you came here, when we came to the states, they met us in Bloomington, met us in Indianapolis actually, and and uh, we stayed with them for a couple of days before sure. we moved into our student quarters. <laughs> so we were fortunate. Yeah, yeah. you had t children by that time. That no, came. oh no, children no. at that time. We had. Um, well, I, I also then was accepted into graduate school because it was one way I could earn a little money. Uh, I got a teaching assistantship and um, enjoyed that very much, actually. It was a good experience. Uh, but we had two boys while we were in graduate school. So when we came to Purdue, we had two little boys. <laughs> very nice. Mm. Um, so tell us a little bit about now coming to Purdue. Um, you also were a visiting instructor at the IU Kokomo campus, and how did your husband happen to come to Purdue? Oh dear, that's a long story. Oh. He, um, after he finished there were his several grade? Egyptians who came into the school of, um, um, I'm trying to think what it was, Physical Education, Health and Recreation Studies. At we IU? all accepted that same year, and they sort of divided them up. A couple of them studied recreation, and a couple did physical education, and so they suggested to my husband that he did health and safety. And uh, he did his dissertation uh, was a study on uh, farm safety in Indiana because they were thinking of increasing mechanization in Egypt, which was very much a peasant type style agriculture, but also had big estates, uh, cotton with their big commercial crop. So that's what he did with the idea it would be useful when he went back. And um, somehow I've gotten all the details, but he was put in touch with the extension services here and was able to get funding to support his, uh, his research um, through Purdue Extension, I think it came from the Department of Agriculture probably. And so he did that study for six months and then Purdue said, we'd like to continue the study that you did for your doctorate for a full year and would you be interested in coming here? So we did. It was a year's appointment and halfway through the year they asked my husband if he would be interested in staying but in physical education, not, not in health education. So he shifted then back to his first love, I suppose, really. And that's when he became interested in fitness and exercise and all the things that he, that he was known for lived. later. Yes, sure. yes. But yeah. uh, he had really fallen in love with statistical analysis, which he'd been totally unfamiliar with. And so I think that he, uh, he really enjoyed he, I think he took every class available in the statistics department <laughs> at the graduate level that he didn't already have. He, he really had a great time. Very good. Uh, doing that. And so what was your, uh, so you first you came here and then uh, you had to, your, you and the children came here. And then what, what it transpired? Did you start teaching at the Kokomo? Uh, no, <clears throat> no, we uh, children were small, of course, and I yeah. stayed home. But actually I, I had, uh, I was no longer a student, and so I got a notification from the Immigration Service saying, you are not maintaining your student status and you must leave the country, so please let us know what arrangements you are making. <laughs> so I made arrangements, actually, to go to England. Then meanwhile, I discovered I was expecting a third child. So I wrote to my mother and said, well, um, what about this? And she said, well, that's fine. You go ahead and come. So of course I had to travel. Um, before I was too pregnant. And so we spent, the children and I spent five months in England then, whilst I then went through all the necessary steps to enter as an immigrant. So when we returned, the boys of course were American, they were born here. And my daughter and I emigrated together. <laughs> she was just a little less than three months old. <laughs> oh, nice. The nice remembrance. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> oh, well, that brings us to, to Purdue. Tell us some things you did before, and then uh, the International Student Services Director, you were the first one for that. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when my youngest child started kindergarten, I did actually, as you mentioned, um, contact Indiana University Kokomo because I'd heard they were looking for somebody, and indeed I did uh, work, uh, served there for 16 years, I think, altogether. As, um, um, what was I called? Adjunct faculty, yes, adjunct faculty member, and, uh, and taught geography. That was my responsibility. So although I was only adjunct, I had a little department all of my own, <laughs> the budget, which was quite nice. And I enjoyed teaching there. Many of the students were not your traditional students. They were people who were returning for some reason. Every time there'd be a slowdown in the automotive industry, we'd get an increase in enrollment because the students would go back to school. And so we had interesting students mm -hmm. that uh, I enjoyed teaching them. Right. And uh, now tell us a little bit about how you got the position as the Internet and the Student Services, a little bit about that, well, your experiences. Um, after that, actually a bit before the 16 years were up, I was contacted. We'd been on sabbatical in England, let me back up. <clears throat> We'd been on sabbatical in England, 1966-67 academic year. And when I returned, um, no, I'll take that back, 1977-78 academic year, we'd been on sabbatical in Yugoslavia, our second sabbatical. And um, I got a call from um, I think the department head of what was geosciences in those days to say, would I be interested in teaching geography at Purdue? <clears throat> so I had an interview and said, well, yes, I would, and I'd be quite happy not to commute so much. And so sure. I, I became um, actually part-time permanent faculty uh, in the geoscience department and I taught there for three years and toward the end of that time I was contacted by the Dean of Student Services and by then I was very involved in working with the International Center. I'd been involved in it from the very beginning, been on their founding board. It was founded in 1971 and this was 1982 and so that's why I was approached I think. I. Uh, and asked if I had any suggestions and, uh, of someone who might be interested because Mr. Chichen was retiring, the existing foreign student advisor. And also, incidentally, your name has been put forward by several people and we would like to know if you're interested. So first I thought, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and my husband, I think, talked me into at least saying, yes, I would be interested. So I was interviewed along with other candidates and shortlisted. Uh, one of three, and then we went to a more intensive interview process, of course, and uh, you were the one selected. <laughs> yeah. right, that's and nice. they changed the name at that point in time to Director of International Student Services, Foreign Student Advisor. Foreign Student had begun to have a slightly negative context, I think, and so um, most universities about that time yeah. did that. Their offices became international. Um, and you were the goals for the offices to give international students enough help to allow them to become independent. And so some of the things that you were involved in there. Well, the, the there were actually some requirements. All universities who accepted international students were required to have what was called a responsible officer. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was the president, but the president delegated that to whoever the person was. And you were responsible to both the immigration service and, at that time, the U.S. Information Agency for all of the programs involving international students, just regular students coming and also all the exchange programs. So that was our main responsibility. Plus we handled all the admission of undergraduate international students. I mean, we were the admission unit for that. We worked with domestic admissions, of course. And we also um, served in a sort of advisory screening capacity for the graduate school. And most of our students at that time were graduate students. Most of our international students were graduate students. On top of all that, which was quite, quite a lot of work, yes. <laughs> we also were the advising center. So we weren't really a counseling office. We would steer the student to appropriate counseling if they needed counseling of any kind. So we worked very closely with Dean of Students, Psych Services, sure. the Health Center, and right. so on. But um, 
Yes, we did. And you planned a lot of activities. You had some welcomes and things of that sort for the students. Uh, we, pl we had an orientation, yes. Sure. On the uh, International Center, and we worked very closely together at that time on uh, putting the orientation together, which, which helped a great deal. Mm -hmm. they, they still do. They still help a great deal with orientation. Right. So we developed that. Um, there'd always been an orientation. I think we just carried it a little so a little more depth. Yeah, backing a little bit, you mentioned before there was just a, uh, somebody who was not a specific officer, there was just an advisor, is that prior um, to you taking no, over as the director? No, I, I think the advisor would have been the responsible officer okay. even then, yes. yes. For Mr. the international? Tisher was the responsible sure. officer for sure. When we came here, he handled all the, for my husband, all of the necessary right. visa work and so on. Right. And also for faculty, staff and faculty, we right. did it for staff okay. and faculty as well as students. For researchers comment on the International Center, that was something that was in La West Lafayette, uh, correct? Is that it? Speaking of the International Center? The International Center right. was founded in 1971. And you've been very much involved in that. Yes. You know, right. Yes. And it was originally right near campus, but now it's moved. It was right near uh, St. Right. Thomas on that same yes, street. Yes, well now it's on Russell Street, sure. it's still near campus. Um, actually, the way we got it um, was one of the international students from Columbia who went on to become the dean of, of um, business at, um, I'm trying to think where, Bogota, I think, University. Um, anyway, he, he was uh, living over the garage at Westwood. Uh, the R.B. Stewart's, of course, were there. And so he really had R.B. Stewart's ear. And he had a lot to say about how much the international students needed a place of their own. Fritz Dieroff, his name was, and he was of German origin, but he was from Colombia. And so one day, the, um, there was a person at St. Thomas who was designated as their international sort of coordinator because they had so many students. The phone rang and she picked it up, and it was Arby Stewart, uh, Mary Pat Sizek. And um, he said, would you like a house for your international center on Marto Street? Because I've got one for you. <laughs> we paid rent. They paid it a modest rent for it. Sure. But that was how we got it. Very good. And it was a PRF house, of course. And we. Um, All right. And it worked out very nicely. Stayed there until they pulled it down. And <laughs> right. then Dr. Beering, uh, who naturally was also very interested always and very supportive of the International sure. Center, right. uh, they came up with the idea of the two houses they now have, which incidentally were the, um, what did they call them, the sort of model homes for the home ex students and the course, demonstration homes demonstration I think demonstration homes right yeah I remember but that didn't last for very long because that way of teaching home economics kind of went away right it <laughs> changed well, a lot that's right yes yeah. <laughs> I think speech I think speech and hearing had been using it yeah, uh, right. clinic. right right yeah. um, you had some liaison tell us about the liaison with the State Department and the immigration you had pretty close contact with them Yes, you, right. yes, both in the did. state and at the federal level as well, or well, immigration's all federal, right? But there were some uh, local. There would be local offices, maybe in the Chicago. Local office. We came under the Chicago office, okay. and then there was a sub office in Indianapolis. Oh, yes, indeed, we kept on very friendly terms with those gentlemen. <laughs> they were mostly gentlemen. The uh, head of the office at that time in Chicago really liked college campuses. He liked that side of his work, and he called me up one day and said. Um, you know, I kind of like to visit a college campus. Um, I could, my wife and I come down, he brought his wife along. And um, so we got to know him very well. And uh, I think we that worked. That was a good contact. <laughs> very good contact. I think we always worked very hard at uh, trying to make sure. We always did a few things that slipped through the cracks, but we were usually pretty observant. And uh, he was very cooperative and helpful. And if we did need help, we knew we could always Count turn to him and say, we've got this crisis, can sure. you advise us? And we also worked closely with the people in Indianapolis. I got to know a lot of the immigration lawyers at that time in Indianapolis, and they were kind enough to invite me to their monthly meeting, which I usually attended because I I think it was a mutual benefit, actually. I learned a lot from them, and they did a lot of things sure. they didn't do. But it's a two-way street, and you worked challenge. together. It's a challenge, really, to keep everybody, and particularly staff and faculty, they're more difficult than students, really. Right. And there you have to go through the Department of Labor to get uh, 
permission to employ labor certification. Sure. So anyway, it was complicated yeah. and challenging, but uh, it worked I through. I sort of enjoyed doing that. Right. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> problem solving, I call it. <laughs> Did you uh, do any travel in conjunction with the as an international service? Yes, quite a bit. Okay, quite a bit. Um, um, any particular trip that you'd like to comment on? That, well, uh, very shortly. Up? I think I'd only been in the office probably not yet a year when um, I received a phone call from. It wasn't an embassy because we had recognized China, mainland China by then, so it was the Office Coordination Council, it was called, for Taiwan. Had I ever been to Taiwan? I said, no, I hadn't. What would I like to? And so that was my first trip, along with, I think, about 10 other folks who had similar jobs to mine. And their trip, that was more or less a thank you trip, because we had a lot of students from Taiwan. They were a numerous group in the country as a whole, and they had a very well planned out routine. It was partly formal visits, partly um, tourism, really. We were taken to sites of interest, but we did visit a number of universities, and Purdue was very well known in Taiwan, um, partly because of Professor Nora Shreve, who had helped set up engineering at Kaishung University. Right. And so we went there. And <laughs> they really made a big deal. And I knew Nara Shreve because he was a neighbor. And oh my goodness, they were just enchanted to think they had the best to actually do him. <laughs> and they did put together a very nice alumni meeting. And uh, um, it, was, it was interesting. It was funny, actually, because everybody else said, oh, aren't you lucky you're going to have a wonderful Chinese meal? We had some marvelous food. And guess what they did? Yeah. Bacon I mean. chips. <laughs> <laughs> Bacon french fries. <laughs> but they were so sweet. They, they were very eminent, all men. And um, I think there were three or four university professors. There was a minister, and they wanted to hear all about Purdue football. So I, George King got me some films, and I took films over. <laughs> to Good for you. Good you knew that in advance. <laughs> I knew that in advance. We had a real alumni. Oh, I bet. Meeting in Hong Kong with yeah. a young man who'd been in the Glee Club who sang for us. Did, uh, you, interact, did you get to meet some of the students while you were there, too? Or yes, we did meet a few. Uh -huh. Yes, we did, who were wishing to come. In fact, we talked with students in general. It was not a recruiting trip. No. Purdue did not recruit international students at that time at all. Sure. But we did get to speak to a few groups of students. Mostly, though, we dealt, we met with faculty and mm -hmm. with Ministry of Education officials. And we were beautifully treated. I mean, it was just a really Very nice. first class tour. I, Consider myself well, very fortunate. Remember. Yeah, well, yeah. the beautiful museum, the National Museum, with many of the treasures that were taken by the Chiang Kai shek government, of course, when they fled to to Taiwan. Taiwan right. or there. Yeah. It's an incredible museum. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any other trips that you took in, while you were in? Well, Atlanta? I went to mainland later. I was in oh, the first you? group that went to mainland again because Purdue had a large number of visiting scholars, and Wisconsin and Stanford and MIT. I've forgotten that all the universities, but there were 10 of us who went on the mainland trip. That was in 1985, so three years later. And we were the first group, so they weren't quite sure how to deal with us. And it was interesting to see how they sort of developed their ideas as we went along. And toward the end of the trip, they had the idea that we, they really had to put us together with students, and that worked quite well. So that was a nice, that was yeah. kind of a nice thing then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about um, campus life during your the, your tenure? Has it changed a lot? Do you think since you've been here? Well, it's grown bigger, grown, of course. Grown larger. Um, the, the campus as a whole, there were the international students. Are there's more than than oh, when you first there were, there were fifteen hundred plus a little when I took over. Um, yes, in nineteen eighty two, and by the time I left, um, it was twenty six. Hundred and some, I think, and of course now it's over five thousand. So it's kind of doubled <laughs> both right, times. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you served. You served under a couple of uh, presidents, Dr. Baring, and uh, this was when you were here in. in yes, it was State. actually interim. It was uh, Dr. Hicks was the interim president when I first okay. uh, started, and I knew him, of course. So that was nice. And then Dr. Baring, and then uh, um, well, Dr. Baring, yeah. Right, and Dick Grace and Bob Bringle, of course, you knew both of them. Uh, yeah. yeah, Bill Fishang was the vice president, too. Oh, okay. Too. Okay. Um, 
the uh, point of me and then Dick Grace right. and then of course Dr. Ringo, yeah. Right, and you got a couple of awards that uh, special Boilermaker award. That's kind of neat. Yeah, yes. that was nice. And well, that, that was that was Dean Yang. Um, Dean Yang would come to me himself quite often if there was some student he was particularly concerned about or interested in. And one little story I must tell you: he would come and just stand in the line if there was a line. Just come to the receptionist and say he wished to see me. And I had a new receptionist, and so she said to him, "What kind of visa do you have? An F or a J?" <laughs> she meant a regular student or exchange student. And he said, "Well, neither. Actually, I'm a dean of engineering. I, I heard later the poor girl ran off, <laughs> ran off in <laughs> some distress to think she did that because then, of course, she." <laughs> called me and said, Dean Yang is here to see you, but we, um, he teased me a great deal about that. <laughs> <laughs> he could, he, he could was go, always very supportive. He could go with that, right. Yeah. And then you got that, that's nice, in 93, that Distinguished Service Award from the Department of Student Services. Yes, that that's was very nice. Dr. Grace, yeah. yeah. Did yeah. they, did you know a little bit in advance that you were going to get it, or? Yes, and I was actually on a, I'd retired, and I was on a, a workshop trip to Bulgaria and Romania at the time it was actually awarded. But Dr. Tishner also got one. I mean, um, Mr. Tishner, Dean Tishner, I used to call him, um, got one at the same time. Yeah. So that, and he that, came for it, I believe. He yeah, was here that's for nice. it. Yeah. Um, and then you got the National 96 at National Society of Daughters of American Revolution Americanism Award. Did you get um, that? Yeah. Daughter of the American Revolution, yeah. That's the kind of ship award. That was the surprise. That's <laughs> I good. Really, I asked why. Well, um, it was for naturalized citizens. And um, yeah, part of that was a very nice personally signed letter from President Clinton, who was president at the time. It's kind of nice. Framed. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of nice. Okay. Mm. Now your family, tell us a little bit where uh, the children, uh, some, one lives here, one's on the faculty, is that correct? Um, Joe, yes. Uh -huh. uh, he's the middle child. Uh, he's on the faculty in consumer family science in uh -huh. uh, hospitality, tourism, uh, management. And your other son lives in? Uh, he lives in Zionsville. Okay. And he's in the mailing business, diversified mail services. Mm -hmm. And your daughter lives in? New she Mexico. lives in New Mexico, yeah. and she's a cardiologist. Right, okay. Uh, now I'm going to ask, uh, what's your favorite memory of Purdue? What would you like to share with us? Oh, my goodness. You can take so more than many. one. I've been here a long time. I know. <laughs> my goodness. And you're looking came back in 58. on it. Hmm. That is a while. Yes. Yes, it See, is. it's changed a lot. Yeah. I think one of my really startling memories, because I think I, I really almost scared Dr. Fishhang. I was appointed in June, but I didn't actually take over until August, and I'd already got a trip to England planned, and so he agreed I could start in August. So I went right into orientation. I therefore had time to plan things, and I came up with the idea of closing Marcella Street, where the International Center was, and having a street barbecue there. What more American could you, could you have to show international students and their parents? And we got permission from the police to close the street from the city, and we were allowed to use St. Thomas Aquinas' kitchen, and we really did put on a tremendous barbecue. We, many of us had our husbands involved in cooking. I think Kiwanis helped us, and maybe El Teresa Club. And anyway, it was a huge success. And um, Dr. Fishan confessed to me afterwards he drove by to see how it was going. <laughs> he was very dubious about this activity, but we did it for many years. We, we did eventually sure. give up. We only have one bad day, weather day, and I think that discouraged the folks who by then had sort of taken over the running of it, and uh, <laughs> we changed to a bit more indoor activity, but it was great fun. It didn't oh, stop. This was just great. Imagine you can close a street. I know. There was music. and that A really great event. Nice walk. Yes, right. it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I think that's one of my favorites, yeah. because it was a bit dear, and you know, it could have <laughs> You never know how it's going to really go, and you also pray for the weather. But of course, each generation told the next about, oh, yeah, you can go to the barbecue. <laughs> Once those things start, they perpetuate themselves. They do. And Which I is remember nice. one of the last ones we had, my son was already here, and he and his wife did the cooking for it, <laughs> or helped do the cooking for it. Yeah. Now, um, how about you got an outstanding event in your life that you would like to share with us? Anything comes to your mind? An outstanding event. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you mean other than getting married and things of that nature? I think going to a garden party at Buckingham Palace. Yes, I think that's How did that come about? pretty high. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, when we first came to Lafayette, to West Lafayette, there was an organization called the Overseas League, which later on was given the Royal Charter, it became the Royal Overseas League, which had a branch in Lafayette. It was the only branch in the U.S. It is an organization headquartered in London, and it's British Commonwealth. So it's all over the British Commonwealth, but of course the U.S. isn't part of the British Commonwealth, so there weren't any branches here except that one. And uh, the person who was the secretary were, had married an American right at the end of World War II. <clears throat> and so we met in their basement. That was our club room. And we were very active. We had a monthly program. And of course, we did meet people from all over the Commonwealth. I've met lots of absolutely wonderful people through that organization. Sure. And we also were members of the headquarters in London, so we could visit there when we went there. And um, Mrs. Messing was the lady's name, uh, kept in very close touch with the consulate in Chicago. And they would write to her every so often and say, do any of your members plan to visit London this summer? Because if they are coming, then we would like to get them put on the list for a garden party. And so another lady and I, who was actually an American, but she married a British man in World War I. So she was considerably older than me, <laughs> but I, we were both going to be there. She was going to be there visiting her in-laws, and I was going to be there visiting my family. And so we met up, and I, I certainly was dressed in buried fine, borrowed finery, I must confess, a very pretty feather hat belonging to my sister, and we took ourselves off to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite exciting. It really was. Um, you have to have a cab or, you know, a rented car, and you're driven in, and, and then you walk through a part of the palace, really through from the front of Buckingham Palace. You've seen the picture, I'm sure. You go through doors that are right straight in front of the gate, and um, you go through two lots of sort of corridors, and you come out on the gardens in the back. So you do get a chance to see a little of the inside of the palace. And then when everybody is assembled, they um, start directing people so that there are two lines that were the day we were there between the folks that the royal party moves down. And one, one group, I think it was um, the Queen and Prince Philip, and the other was some other, I've forgotten, Lord Louis Mountbatten maybe. And so you've got quite fairly close to them, but only people who'd been told beforehand got to speak to them. They would bring forward the people who were going to meet them, so you could look on. And then you were served, of course, quite an IT and the big tent, and told you could wander around the garden if you wished, but everybody had to be out by a certain time. So we, we had a very interesting day. Our day was um, the people who were invited were uh, overseas visitors and the arts, so there were a lot of, of uh, theatre people there. Do you remember the TV series Hazel? I don't think I remember uh, that There was a character in it, an English couple in this movie. And I saw this woman and thought, I know you. How, how do I know you? And I realized it's a woman <laughs> from Hazel. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we did thoroughly enjoy ourselves. And we did explore the garden. And we did look at the royal children's. Uh, they had a little trailer that they played in and had their little books in and so on. And we were allowed to poke around and look at things like that. What it fun. fun. What yeah, a lovely of afternoon. They started shushing us out after an appropriate yeah. period of time, the Queen and Queen mm. Prince Philip, Princess Margaret, and Lord Louis Mountbatten is who I remember as uh -huh. being there. Yeah. Well, in retirement, what have been oh, your activities since you retired from the university? Anything you'd like to comment on? Well, I keep kept on the project, which was um, a workshop that um, wrote a report, put together a report on the educational systems of Bulgaria and Romania. And that took a couple of years, took longer than I expected, really. <laughs> but, um, and of course other people worked on that with me, but I was the director of that. That was interesting. I traveled quite a bit. Yeah. You, you still have family, well, your sister still lives in, in oh, England. Oh yes, in uh -huh. England. To other places too, a good friend and I traveled to South America at different times. Some of it before I retired, actually. 
get yourself in gear. Yeah, I did some other very interesting, yeah. very interesting trips to Indonesia too. Um, from Athens, down, let's say, to Istanbul and down the Red Sea and to Oman and Dubai. And uh, I've been to Dubai a couple of times. I have some family there, right. so yeah. I'm and you had a big anniversary this year, and you and the children oh, surprised yes, you. Yes, yes. And they, you went on a cruise, right? We went on a cruise from um, Venice. We all met in Venice. I went to England, and my sister and I joined everybody else then in Venice. And we went down the Adriatic and to Bari and to Olympia, which was exciting before all the terrible fires, which occurred later. And then we went to the Greek islands, ending up in Rhodes, which I had not been to, and I really enjoyed Rhodes. Then we came back and stopped at Dubrovnik on the way back. Oh, that's back very Back to Venice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was a good trip. Very nice. beautiful weather and calm seas. And, kind of a yeah. special nice thing. Yeah, you know? it was. It was nice <laughs> to all be together like that. Mm. Yeah. Any, couple, any comments in closing that you'd like to share with the researchers that, uh, about the student services or yourself or whatever? Any comments you'd like yeah. to make? I think that um, as a service to international students, it's hard to really um, express, I think, how important that office was and how much a lot of the volunteers who worked with it did. Can I tell you one story that I think really is yeah. Good. typical of the kind of support? We had a lot of volunteers, mostly working through the um, International Center at that time. and. Uh, one quite eminent, and I can't tell you his name now because I forget, quite eminent international alum came back to give one of the um, lectures in the, the Cranert series. And he began by saying, my first memory of Purdue is coming to the orientation here and being told I would need a warm coat. And there was a coat lady who would take care of me. And he said, I met the coat lady in due course, and she was a white-haired grandmotherly sort who found a coat that she thought would just fit me to perfection. <laughs> and so I don't know her name, but I wore that coat the whole time I was at Purdue, and it always left me with a very warm, nice feeling about Purdue that they would go to the <laughs> Well, the lady is Gail Kirkpatrick, who's still still living. She's in Westminster now. And uh, I thought it was interesting that that was the first thing he thought of when he came back. And he did talk. not forget it. He did it not It made forget a big it. impression. So I think we really tried to make them feel at home. At the same time, he tried to make them independent. I mean, we did not wish to be um, babysitters or nannies for the international right, students. Yeah. And so we did our best to show them the way or to steer them in the right direction. And, and be there as a resource. Yeah, and right. most of them really did pretty well here, I think. And do you still hear from some of the students, too? Oh, I do. Oh, yes, That's I nice. do, especially at Christmas time. Right. Yeah. That yeah. is really nice. Yeah. Very good. Well, any other comments you think that uh, that you'd like to share Well, with I us? think it's just great to see Purdue doing so well in this field. I don't know if, if you knew this, but three three years ago, I think, now, Purdue was the recipient of the Simon Award, named after Paul Simon, and it's given to the university that's viewed as providing the best service. It's a really prestigious award in our field, and um, I think it does great credit to Purdue. Uh, right. We've been, of course, our numbers have doubled, and uh, the staff in the office <laughs> troubled, I think. Right. Just to handle it. <laughs> uh, well, because there's so much more work since 9-11, especially, that sure. has to be undertaken. But it wasn't only for the, um, it's now called Students and Scholars, of course, the office is now the Office of International Students and Scholars. It was for all of the international work, the, the study right. abroad and all the other aspects, too. But it was a very nice recognition for Purdue. That is nice. I felt quite a little glow of pride, sort of, by you should. <laughs> association, I suppose. Not very there you go. About that. Right. Yeah. Good. Very good. Yeah. Mr. And Marjorie, I'd like to thank you very much for this interview. I really appreciate that. Okay, this concludes it. Thank you.